do fossil sequences always point to Darwinian evolution? Or is there a better way of explaining that continuity? Hey, King Colson uh, here from Creation Unfolding. Welcome back to part four uh, in this series. Uh, please go back and watch parts one and three. Uh, there's just so much information that's going to be brought up in this video. And if you haven't watched those videos, especially the last one, you're going to get lost. So I'd go back, you know, put it on two speed if you want, but make sure you watch those videos. Just as a really quick summary for the last part of part three, we looked at Richard Owen. We looked at his archetype. Uh, his archetype is that uh, funny looking creature at the top center of that screen uh, which he created and he believed that that archetype which itself was built on a single vertebra he believed that that was the foundation for all vertebrates and that uh, through addition you would uh, accumulate adaptations until you get to the human form of course he was a creationist and so he believed that these uh, different forms would be progressively created through history uh, the other person of interest we looked at was Joseph McLeese and uh, Joseph McLeese, uh, he was a uh, comparative uh, anatomist. I think I think he was a surgeon, uh, and he uh, wrote his own book on uh, on an archetype. And he actually uh, published this book before Richard Owen. So Richard Owen published his in 1849, I believe, uh, or 1848. He published his in 1847. But he must have been familiar with uh, Richard Owen's uh, view because he actually talks about you know a vertebra in his in his particular model but anyway and and i went over that in part three but anyway uh, mcleese believed that rather than building up uh, from a basic vertebrate we actually build down from the most uh, complex or perfect vertebrate which is a human form and so he believed that sort of a conceptual atom existed in the mind of god and that you get uh, more and more basic vertebrates through the process of subtraction so they were the two views, and importantly, we looked at the concept of continuity, that uh, both of these scientists, and in fact, uh, most of the scientists and philosophers and Christian theologians of the day really had no problem with the concept of continuity. We looked at the, the scala naturae uh, from Socrates, right? We've uh, From Socrates uh, and Aristotle and Plato. And we've looked at that, how you start off with the most basic forms and get up to the most complex form. They all sort of accepted some conceptual idea of that. And so they had no problems with the idea of transitions. They did all believe in continuity of form. And these scientists also believed in that continuity of form for vertebrates. And they really had no problem or qualms with the, with the idea of some sort of a transition between one vertebrate and another because that fit their conceptual metaphysical model. In fact, it wasn't until Darwin came along uh, with his views, and that, that later creationists began to really poo-poo the idea of transitions. Why? Well, because it smacked too much of evolution, but realized that before Darwin, transitions were totally fine and acceptable. Darwin, of course, came along. He knew about these metaphysical ideas. He knew about the concept of continuity between forms, uh, unity of type, uh, archetypes and things like this because as I said earlier these metaphysical ideas and books were published they were well read uh, by very educated uh, academic people and he understood these ideas but he wanted to uh, reinterpret the concept of continuity from a basic vertebrate in fact from all life to the most complex life he wanted to reinterpret that in terms of uh, naturalistic mechanisms and hence we have Darwinian evolution Okay, so that brings us to uh, what I'm going to call the biblical archetype. What is the archetype then? We've looked at what Owen had to say. We've looked at what MacLeese had to say. Of course, uh, Darwin's archetype was actually a physical entity that evolved. Um, and we've looked at uh, Plato uh, and Aristotle and the concept of ideas and forms and archetypes there as well. And of course, I'm going to propose uh, an archetype in the model here. But we've looked uh, at a lot of 19th century science. Let's have a look and see what the Bible has to say. Now, before I do go there, there is this quote uh, from, uh, it was published recently by a creationist organization, which I'll keep anonymous. Um, they're responding to uh, my book, really criticizing my idea 
that we could somehow know anything about what's going on in God's mind. And so they say this, it is hard to overestimate the hubris involved in trying to probe God's mind and even postulate a model for the universe and how that might interact with possible creationist research when nothing in scripture even hints at what might be in God's mind. And, and uh, you read the rest of the article, it's quite clear that the authors are saying we should not try and figure out what's going on in the mind of God. And I disagree with that for a number of reasons. Number one, the scriptures themselves uh, really uh, seem to cause us and uh, beckon us towards that uh, idea. Uh, here's just a few verses. Uh, Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the ages began. So here God is making promises. I mean, that's fascinating. Uh, Ephesians 1-4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So here God's making choices. Uh, John 17, 24, for you love me before the foundation of the world. So here God loves God the Son. God the Father loves God the Son. And uh, Revelation 13, 8, this is the KJV uh, v version, which I prefer. Uh, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I mean, when you read that, surely you're wanting to know what this looks like. All right. We have this much information, but what else was going on uh, in that eternal plan? Uh, Acts 4.27, uh, Luke says, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Um, and there's a lot of other Bible verses as well. But this is fascinating because this teaches us that the triune Godhead has orchestrated the plan of salvation from before the universe was even created. In other words, there was a lot going on in the mind of God before he created anything. And these texts do seem to beckon uh, us to be inquisitive about that plan. And it's not just the New Testament authors. Highly respected modern Christian theologians and pastors have also thought about this. So here's a quote from uh, John Piper. God gave us grace, undeserved favor towards sinners. In Christ Jesus, before the ages began, we had not yet been created, we had not been existed so that we could sin, but God had already decreed that grace and in Christ kind of grace, blood bought grace, sin overcoming grace, would come to us in Christ Jesus. All that was in the mind of God before the creation of the world. So there is a book of life of the Lamb who was slain, and there is grace flowing to undeserving sinners in Christ who are not yet created. Uh, here, Piper is obviously drawing on those cues from the New Testament and this eternal plan which was set in motion before God created anything. Schaefer also says this, something existed before creation, and that something was personal and not static. The Father loved the Son, there was a plan, there was communication, and promises were made prior to the creation of the heavens and the earth. And notice that he says there's something existed. So here, uh, Schaefer believes that something actually existed before anything ever did. He also says this, We are faced, therefore, with a very interesting question. When did history begin? If one is thinking with the modern concept of the space-time continuum, then it is quite obvious that time in history did not exist before in the beginning. But if we are thinking of history in contrast to an eternal, philosophic other, or in contrast to a static eternal, then history began before Genesis 1.1. So here these authors are wanting to contemplate concepts and ideas that existed in the mind of God before he created anything. Uh, now, of course, uh, we can't be definitive, but we can hypothesize. And in fact, that's what theologians and philosophers have been doing for thousands of years, writing about things related to this eternal plan, things like atonement, or things like uh, predestination, or things like free will. Uh, how do all of those ideas and concepts, and many others, uh, which we've only been given snippets of, how do they all interrelate? And that's what these theologians and philosophers have been writing about. Should they not write about those things? Of course they should. And so that's why I think that that statement by that creationist organization is in error. Now, as I said, uh, philosophers uh, and theologians have been talking about this really since the time of the New Testament church. Um, Augustine, for example. Uh, now, Augustine, and I'm going to quote Thomas Aquinas as well, were influenced by uh, Plato and by Aristotle. 
But that doesn't mean that what they had to say was in error. They were very, very careful to make sure that their application or their drawing upon uh, Plato and Aristotle conformed to the scriptures. And I think that they're picking their cues here from those verses that we've just looked at at which again causes to be inquisitive about what was going on in the mind of God and about plans. So Augustine says uh, this in this book Christian Philosophy, uh, by the way highly recommended if you're looking for a basic book on philosophy uh, by some reform guys. He says this, for Augustine the Platonic forms have now found a home in the mind of God. God fashions the creation freely out of nothing according to these ideas which function as a kind of a blueprint. So what can Augustine not talk about possible blueprints and what those blueprints might have looked like? Of course not. Of course you should. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, uh, again from the same book, Thomas's attention to Aristotle also deeply impacts his ontology. Since God has created all creatures after their own kind, there is order in the world. Drawing on Aristotle, Thomas speaks of the various forms or types in matter that make creatures what they are. These ideas or forms were in the mind of God and functioned as a blueprint does for a builder when God created the world. Again, he's drawing on Aristotle. But does that mean that Thomas Aquinas should not be thinking about what blueprints made up these uh, animals that we have in creation? Of course not. Uh, the medieval church was the same. Uh, for the realist, the universal really exists either in a spiritual world or in the entity itself. Much of the medieval theological tradition followed Augustine in the belief that these ideas really exist in the mind of God and, uh, of course, the church in the 17th century. The locus of the forms was debated throughout the 17th century, but Christian Aristotelianism located them in the mind of God. And, of course, these things were picked up by Christians and creationists like um, Richard Owen. So, I just again, just I, I had to go through all of that um, because I'm going to be talking about abstract ideas, conceptual ideas. And I, I just want you, the audience, to know that I think this is very biblical. It's perfectly, it's scriptural, it's biblical, and it's okay to do this as long as we realize that it's a hypothesis. Um, theologians and philosophers and great godly men, modern men and women today have been doing the same thing. And so I think that this statement is, uh, is in error. Now I want to take us back to this information we looked at earlier. So this was uh, the scriptures where we saw that God's predetermined plan of salvation had been worked out in eternity past. And what I want to draw your attention to here is Revelation 13.8. Uh, it says that the Lamb, speaking of Jesus Christ, was slain from the foundation of the world. And in fact, we know from other scriptures that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Now, this is fascinating when you think about it, because um, what it means is that atonement, in order for atonement to be successful, you need the shedding of blood, you need uh, the body of a human that was sacrificed uh, which then corresponds to the lamb that was slain from before the foundation of the world. Well, that means then that not only was the plan of redemption worked out in the mind of God from all eternity, but that plan must have included some kind of human form or physiology. In other words, Jesus's biology, uh, right down to uh, bones, organ systems, organs, tissues, cells, and different kinds of cells, uh, neurons, neurotransmitters, um, molecules, and atoms, all of that had not only been foreknown, but must have been pre-planned and designed in all eternity past. I mean, that's fascinating when you think about it. And so that means then that um, no matter whether you're a young earth creationist, old earth creationist, or a theistic evolutionist, you must believe that some kind of um, conceptual um, human-like archetype, at least for the human form, existed in all eternity. That has to be true based on what we know of scripture, 
based on the lamb being slain from the foundation of the world, the blood that was shed, and a human sacrifice that was required. And since the shedding of human blood necessarily atones for sin, and we don't know how the full ramifications of all of that, but God does, then all of that must have been pre-planned and designed from all eternity. So that's fascinating. Now, it doesn't say anything about the rest of the biological realm, okay? I think we can know then for certain that at the very least, the human form, the, the archetype of the human form was actually foreknown and foreordained from all eternity past. That's a no-brainer. That has to be true if we believe these scriptures and many other scriptures as well. But like I said, that doesn't determine what the rest of the uh, biosphere looked like. What about plants and animals and invertebrates and vertebrates? It doesn't tell us anything about that. But what we can learn is that if Jesus's biological physiology was known from all eternity past, not only known, but planned out, working, articulating in the mind of God, then it turns out that the organization of the human form was also known and worked out. So here you have typical uh, biology textbook organization for the human form. We start out with an atom, molecule, macromolecule, organelle, cell, tissue, organ, organ systems, and humans. Humans do have this organization in their, in, in their body. Now, of course, um, from a purely naturalistic or materialistic perspective, we always think in terms of organization from a bottom-up approach, right? We start off with, for example, when it, when it comes to Darwinian evolution, well, we start off with a cell, and then you get more complex life and more and more complex life, and that's the way things evolve. That can't be true for God. So when God, when God uh, designed the human form, Christ in eternity past, uh, that which would become flesh, uh, all of his organ systems, organs, tissues, cells, organelles, macromolecules, molecules were already there. It's not like the atom was first and God required the atom first. No, they were all there at the same time. But the principle of organization is true. Uh, and that is that there does seem to be uh, that which is fundamental, and then God does seem to build on fundamental levels, uh, building in complexity until he gets to his desired teleological end. And of course, for human beings, it would be the human form. So I want to propose then sort of um, the conceptual physiological form of humans as being one end member, uh, like MacLeese was thinking, but I want to propose that the other end member, since we're talking about uh, organ, uh, organisms, uh, would be a cell, a single cell. Jesus Christ was composed, the smallest living component of his physiology were cells. And today, the smallest living component, a quantum for life, is a cell, a, a bacteria. So I want to propose that um, the cell was one end member and uh, the uh, the final cause or the teleological end, which was the human physiology, is the other. When it comes to some kind of pre-planned biological organization for all of life. So that's what I want to propose. And again, remember, this is a hypothesis. Okay, We're looking at God's creation. Uh, and as we'll see shortly, we're looking into the Word of God. And we have been looking into the Word of God to try and come up with a picture and an explanation for what we see in the world. So I want to think in terms of end members, but remember in the mind of God, these end members are there at the same time, okay, because God is outside of time. Okay, so I want to propose that these are the end members. I, I want to propose that there is then organization, uh, like there is in human physiology, there's organization to uh, living organisms, um, pre planned biological organization. And this pre-planned biological organization is actually true when we look at the rest of biology. Think about how a human develops. So not only is that organization true in uh, human physiology, it's also true in human development. So we come from an egg, and that egg uh, divides, differentiates, and um, 
the human form goes through infinite numbers of iterations of change in a process of development until it reaches its teleological end, which is a human form. Um, and interestingly, uh, I'm talking about pre-planned biological organization for, for, for the entire biosphere, and, but specifically we are going to be just looking at vertebrates that existed in the mind of God. Um, but that's also true for human form, right? So um, every uh, a, a human uh, that's conceived, they're, a, they're not a potential human, right? They're a human already with great potential because their teleological end has already been determined. And so we see that pre-planning already there inside the zygote. So I think that's fascinating that we see pre-planned biological organization already, we see examples of it every day. And so why not think in terms of that for uh, creatures, for other kinds of creatures? But, and of course, it's not just in the human uh, biology, right? We see this in almost uh, every kind of uh, uh, organismal development. Now, there are exceptions. Uh, uh, so, for example, with uh, metamorphosis, but for the most part, most organisms develop from a seed-like form and follow a path of organization, um, one atom, if you like, or one element on top of another, and you can't have that second element until the first one's already there. We do see that organization in all living or almost all living organisms. And then of course we see this in the order of creation. So if we look at the Genesis account, you have the earth which is covered in water and we assume that there is land underneath the water, but the land is brought out of the water. And so we have this separation of the land from the water, almost like a growing sense of complexity. And then you have the ocean itself, which is separated to produce sky. And so now you have uh, sky and you have ocean. And then you have the creation of the birds and the fish. Now notice that they are not created first. Um, this, in this organizational way of creating, the fundamental aspects have to be in place first. So you need the, the, the ocean needs to be there before you have the fish and the sky needs to be there before you have the birds and, and the land has to be there before you have the animals. So in this concept of a growing organizational complexity, those foundational pieces need to be in place and God seems to build uh, one aspect upon another. And without the foundational uh, piece that goes before it, you don't get the next piece in the sequence. So I do think that you see that in the order of creation. But you see it elsewhere in scripture. Uh, so for example, uh, we see that in Revelation. Um, think about the uh, Proto-Evangelium that's given in Genesis 3.14, uh, where we're told from theologians that the seed-like form of the gospel is birthed, and then uh, throughout scripture, that seed-like form uh, is has many levels of organization as it is built upon and we would say in theological lingo they're fulfilled or partial fulfillments until you get to its ultimate fulfillment which is Christ uh, and that's true for uh, for many other types of revelation in fact I think it's true for almost all kinds of revelation where God's words build on each other um, God's revelation, therefore, we say, is progressive. It has an organization to it. Um, there is Israel. Uh, God doesn't pick a nation. He picks an individual. And then from that individual uh, comes uh, Isaac, and then comes the 12 patriarchs. And from them come a group of people. So there, again, is a growing level of organization. Uh, we see it in the kingdom of God. Uh, Jesus says the kingdom of God starts out as a seed, and then that seed develops. It grows a trunk, it grows large branches, smaller branches, and then leaves, and then the birds come, and they rest in the leaves. So the kingdom of God is also uh, developing in an organizational way, one level upon another. We see it in sanctification. Uh, we don't just get sanctified, 
uh, there is a growing level of uh, sanctification that occurs. This sort of uh, continuity of sanctification that occurs throughout our life. Now, uh, here I want to state it's not always like that. So, for example, justification is discrete, right? It's a one-off uh, reality. But there are many other things in Scripture, many other theological truths in Scripture that do have this concept of growing organization and a continuity in that organization. And I think that um, using those Scriptures and God's creation itself and the organization of the human form, I think it's fair to say that we could apply that to the way God has created and formed the biological realm. Okay, so that brings us to this slide here. So let me explain what's going on. You're looking at a three-dimensional grid. And the grid is made up of these six-sided stars. These six-sided stars have six directions. Uh, you've got a horizontal bar, which goes left and right, a vertical bar, which goes up and down. And you've got this sort of uh, oblique bar, which represents an axis that's actually going into the laptop. So if you have a look over here, you can see it better. You can see that the horizontal and vertical bars here are getting smaller as you're going into the screen, which means that this side of that axis is actually coming out of the screen towards you. So you're looking at uh, this three-dimensional grid, and these uh, three-dimensional stars are connected to each other to give an overall grid. We're not looking at an overall conceptual biosphere. Um, we're looking at um, conceptual space and we're going to sort of limit it just to vertebrates to keep things very simple. So there is no end members here. We don't have Christ physiology on one hand and a cell on the other. We're just looking at vertebrates in general. Importantly, each of these axes, you'll notice, have no discontinuities in them. Uh, by the way, if they end, that just means they go on. I, I, I purposefully did not draw out these axes uh, to go on infinitely because then you would not have been able to detect uh, the 3D grid. But they do go on infinitely in each of those six directions. But each of these axes, you'll notice, is continuous. It doesn't have any discontinuities in it. So if we take two uh, conceptual vertebrates, for example, and place them on uh, one of these axes, then uh, we would see if we place one here at this point on the axis and one over here at that point on the axis and we were to take these conceptual vertebrates and put them in front of us we would be able to distinguish one from the other they would be very very different from each other even though there is um, organizational and morphological continuity that exists between this one at this end and this one at this end so let's say, for example, one is T-Rex, and the other one at this end over here is Sinoceropteryx. So yes, they're very different organisms, even though they're both theropods. They, they have some continuity when you see them in the flesh, so to speak. But they're very, very different. However, in that conceptual space, there is infinite iterations, if you like, or infinite degrees of change that exist on this spectrum of continuity from one organism to the other. And we can only detect that discontinuity when these uh, spaces are separated wide apart. If we were to look at two of these conceptual organisms that were very, very close together, we would see no difference in morphology, even though there is, at least to God. Now, as you look at this grid, you'll notice there are only three axes, right? There are only six directions. Well, why is that? Why is there a bunch of white space around those six directions? Why aren't there axes going off in every possible direction? Well, that's because there is physical constraint that's going to be applied to these organisms. So, uh, all of these conceptual organisms, these pre-programmed uh, biological designs, have to be created in anticipation of the environments, the ecologies, and the biological laws that are going to be true of the earth that God creates. So, for example, uh, all of the organisms that God actually makes, they are going to be constrained by these biological laws. And that's going to affect their organization, it's going to affect their development, 
It's going to affect their morphology and their behavior. So that means then, when we go back to this grid, the reason there is only six directions is because all of God's conceptual designs have to have limits on them if they're going to exist in historical time and space and be under uh, the sovereign providential care of God in accordance with these natural laws. The other constraint is going to be human usefulness. So God is creating the animals, not just because he wants to, but they're going to be useful or helpful to humans. Livestock, of course, are, are, are extremely helpful. And of course, we see that in Genesis 1.25. Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. But I think even the creeping things and the beasts of the earth will also fit into that category when it comes to the dominion mandate. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, that's, yeah, that's interesting, but that's actually not what we see. When you go to Genesis, it says that God created each organism after its kind, which seems to give the impression that there was absolute discontinuity between these organisms. Also, Adam was called to name the animals, and if there was a, uh, a continuous stream, for example, of vertebrates that had no real difference from one iteration to the next, then Adam would not have been able to actually distinctly name separate organisms. So yes, there was absolute discontinuity for those organisms which God actualized during creation week. So this grid merely represents all the different possibilities of morphology for vertebrates that are going to be constrained by those physical laws. In reality, however, God only brought parts of that pre-planned biological organizational grid into reality. And so what you're looking at now is the same grid, but I've just taken out sections. And in some places, I've taken out large sections. So you can see in this section here, there's a big discontinuity between these organisms down here and these organisms up here. However, there's lesser amounts of discontinuity up here. So for example, you've got this organism, whatever it is, and this one. And although there's discontinuity that separates them, they're more like each other, morphologically speaking and behavioral speaking and organizationally speaking, than they are to any of these organisms down here. Uh, there's different levels of discontinuity. So you've got one organism that's sort of on its own right here, and you can see that it has quite a bit of discontinuity that exists around it. So uh, this new grid then represents the organisms that God actualized during creation week. These are the actual organisms that God created. And we could, at this point, we could call each one of those black lines there a separate created kind from a creationist perspective. Okay, so what I've done now is I've taken a small portion of this grid, so this portion right here, and I have blown it up uh, to keep things simple. So now what we're looking at is it looks like we've got we've got vertebrates and they're pre-fall vertebrates. So at this point, all of these organisms are pre-fall and they look like they're falling into three basic groups. And each one of these groups consists of a number of species. We'll call, uh, we're going to call these either uh, separate created kinds or we could call them species at this point. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven created kinds or species here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven here, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten over here, and that makes up these these three groups. But of course, that's not the end of the story. We know from scriptures that there was the fall, and according to most young Earth creationists, God cursed the ground, and He also cur cursed the biological realm, and we do see implications of that in the text. So, for example, uh, we look at Genesis three fourteen. Because you have done this, speaking to Satan, uh, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go. And of course, although he's talking to Satan, he's also going to curse the actual instrument of Satan's deception, which is the snake as well. And it's interesting, God curses this snake by affecting its mode of locomotion. Now, we don't know exactly what kind of locomotion this particular organism had before it was cursed, but it changed substantially, and I would say it changed rather rapidly at the fall. Whether this means that uh, it's talking about this organism having legs 
and it lost its legs or the legs were diminished. I don't know, but it certainly affected its mode of locomotion. Um, also, it says that you are cursed above all beasts of the field and all livestock, which would seem to imply that they were also cursed, but not to the extent that the snake was. Um, then uh, in Genesis 3.17, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Um, I think this is very, very clear that there is a biological change that occurs to plant life. Uh, at one point, they were helpful to humans, and now they're a hindrance to humans because they're uh, growing thorns and thistles. And uh, Francis Schaeffer, speaking of this particular uh, verse, says this, All these changes, talking about the thorns and thistles, came about by fiat. Creation, as we have already seen, came by fiat. And though we have come to the conclusion of creation with the creation of Eve, yet fiat has not ceased. The abnormality of the external world was brought about by fiat. So here, um, Schaefer is not just actually talking about the thorns and thistles here. He's actually talking about uh, all of the biological realm. What he's saying is that at the fall, there was a fiat change that was equivalent to that that occurred during creation week. In other words, it was a miracle. There was some kind of miraculous change in these organisms that changed them to become, as he says, abnormal. Talking about the thorns and thistles, he says, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. The word thistles here means luxuriously growing but useless plants. The phrase, it shall bring forth to thee, has in the Hebrew the sense of it shall be caused to bud. This phrase therefore suggests that here too the change was wrought by fiat. That is, the plants had been one kind of thing and were reproducing likewise, and then God spoke and the plants began to bring forth something else and continue to reproduce in that new and different form. So that's really interesting. Uh, so Schaefer's talking about fiat uh, change or a miracle that occurred at the fall that changed the biological constitution of all of Earth's organisms, making them abnormal. Now, there are other changes that are implied in Scripture as well. In Genesis 3.18, uh, God says this to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. So there is some kind of physiological change that occurs to the woman or to women. Uh, then, the, so those ones are explicit, right? There's absolutely explicit that there is going to be biological change in organisms. But there are other implicit ones. So, for example, in Genesis 1.28, God says, And to every beast of the field, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And I think it's very clear there that God, God is not just prohibiting meat, as I hear a lot of old earth creationists say. He's telling them what they can eat. And that's made clear in Genesis 9.3, and that's this verse here. So when you take this verse plus this verse, where God says, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, talking to Adam and Eve. And as I gave you the green plants, I gave you everything. Now, he's not talking about animals here, but he is talking about Adam and Eve, whom he talked about in Genesis 1, 28 and 29. So I think from Genesis 9, 3, we can conclude that not only is he giving humans flesh for food, but he's also going to be giving animals flesh for food. And in fact, in verse 2, it talks about the fear of, of uh, animals uh, being upon them, the human fear being upon them for the first time, which makes sense given what humans are about to do to them. And then you take Isaiah 11 and 65, where Isaiah talks about a cow that will eat straw like an ox, and he talks about the lion, uh, sorry, a lion eating straw like an ox, and he talks about uh, the lion lying down with a lamb. Clearly, Isaiah is thinking back to these early chapters in Genesis. He seems to have believed that animals were uh, non-predatory. And he seems to be thinking in terms of a curse that's going to be lifted in the eschatological state. So in the future, there's going to be a time when animals will go back uh, and revert to their created design in the very beginning. So those uh, three sets of verses together, I think, implicitly tell us that animals 
are going to change in, in significant ways in order to become carnivores and in order to um, commit themselves to predatory ways of life. So in lieu of all of that, I propose that all of Earth's organisms were biologically changed, altered, genetically changed at the fall. So now what we're looking at is the bottom half of that grid. The black lines represent created kinds that were unfallen. The red lines that are superimposed over them represent some kind of morphological, uh, organizational change that occurred to those creatures as a result of the fall. Sometimes that change is minimal. So for example, you've got a black line here and a red line that's very close to it. And sometimes that change was maximal. There were huge changes that occurred in those organisms. Now, I'm not exactly sure how those changes occurred. I know that the creation of the original organisms was fiat. Um, but would I go as far as Schaefer to say that these genetic changes were also fiat? Maybe, or maybe it's a combination of the two. So I do think those changes were allowed to express themselves in non-natural terms. So some kind of supernaturalism, although maybe not going as far as Schaefer does in that it's a fiat uh, miracle change, although it could be because this is creation week and uh, we're allowed the freedom to talk about miracles in that way. And of course, as always, things get even more complicated than that because each one of these genetically altered created kinds that exist post fall themselves diversify. And so that's what these dashed green lines represent. They represent diversity. And so each one of these created kinds, for example, that's now been changed is itself changing and diversifying over time. And that's what they, that's what those dashed lines represent. Each one of those represent a species. So for example, this one would be diversifying into four species. This one would be diversifying also into four species and you would get something similar occurring to each one of these post fall created kinds, unless of course they go extinct. Uh, just removing the black line uh, gives it a little more simplicity so you can see what's going on. But before we move on, um, I do want to talk about how those genetic changes, so that is the post fall sort of fiat genetic changes, uh, plus the sort of naturalistic diversification that occurs afterward. How does that interface and interact with our pre-planned uh, biological organizational grid or our conceptual morphospace uh, that we've discussed earlier. So here we are on the left is that grid and on the right is the organisms that are actualized. In other words, these are the organisms. Um, the black lines represent the organisms brought into existence uh, during creation week. The red lines represent those uh, fiat, either fiat genetic changes as Schaefer uh, thought, or uh, maybe a combination of fiat plus natural processes, in which case these changes unfolded, uh, maybe over just months, weeks, years. I think either way, I think it was very rapid and discreet. And then superimposed over those, I've got just some examples, which are these green dotted or dashed lines, which represent species that I've diversified from those original created kinds. Well, I think with the initial changes, I think it's uh, fairly simple. Uh, these are discrete changes. Uh, they're supernaturally enacted. And so I think, therefore, we can just superimpose those genetic changes over our conceptual morphospace, over our grid on this side. In other words, um, because God is sovereign, he not only knows everything, but he preordains everything. That initial change was built into the genetics of those organisms in conceptual morphospace and then expressed uh, during uh, the fall or post fall. I think that one's fa fairly straightforward. But what do we do then with the diversification that occurs after creation week? So what do we do with these dotted dash lines? How do we represent what's going on there over in our conceptual morphospace? Well, I propose that we use the six pointed stars like we did earlier. The reason being, um, these six directions represent uh, all the possible uh, organizational, morphological and behavioral changes that could occur to that single changed or genetically altered created kind 
over time according to natural processes. There are lots and lots of different iterations that that particular creator kind could have taken on. In other words, there are lots of possibilities. Now, uh, they are constrained um, as before, only with a slight difference. Uh, so their morphology, their organization, their behavior, it is dependent on anticipated environments, ecologies, and biological laws, as with creation week organisms. The difference being now that this is in a fallen world. Now there are going to be a lot of geological and environmental pressures that these organisms are going to feel, so to speak. There's also other pressures, such as predation, that didn't exist before, which means then that latent biological principles or laws <clears throat> that were built into the organisms in eternity past will also begin to be expressed now. But of course, um, that's what the six-sided star is for. It means that um, those constraints still mean that these organisms have only six directions of possible change. And of course, these axes, these three axes can go on infinitely. But of course, in the real world, right, that's not what we see. What we see is on the right, we just see four species that have been expressed. There could have been more. Why not? Why didn't God cause more species to come from that particular created kind? Well, I think that comes down to the sovereignty of God. He, in his sovereign plan, only wanted or only foreordained for those organisms to be created. And although I don't take my authority from philosophy, I do think it's interesting to have a look at um, all of this from a Platonic or an Aristotelian perspective regarding uh, you know, forms or ideas. Um, Don Adams in this book, Ancient Greek Philosophy, Concepts and Controversies, he's not, not a Christian, but it's an interesting read. Um, he talks about uh, you know, uh, possibilities, creatures that could possibly um, have existed. So he talks about the pterosaur here. No laws of nature prevent a pterosaur from evolving the same capacity that bombardier beetles evolve. I don't know if that is possible or not, but anyway, if such a creature did evolve, it would be large enough to kill and eat farm animals as well as farmers. So this is a real form, despite the fact that no such creature has ever or will ever hopefully exist. In other words, he's saying, look, this is possible using the laws of nature, but it never actually came into existence, although it must exist in some sense in the mind of the deity. And of course, he's not a Christian, like I said, he's coming from this uh, platonic uh, perspective. Uh, but he, interestingly, he says this as well about humans. Now, he's going to talk about uh, Homo erectus um, being the ancestor to Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens evolving from Homo erectus. I don't like the word evolution because it's packed with so much baggage. Um, and, and of course, I'm a creationist. I'm not an evolutionist. So I would say that Homo sapiens diversified. Uh, from Homo erectus. In other words, something like Homo erectus more than likely did actually uh, jump off the ark. Uh, perhaps Noah and his family uh, looked something like that. And I think maybe Adam looked something like that. And a lot of creationists are thinking in those terms. So yes, humans have changed and adapted to this broken world, just like all other organisms have. Um, so he's going to use the word evolution. I just think in terms of diversification, but he says Homo sapiens exist because some descendants of Homo erectus evolved into Homo sapiens. Nothing could have evolved into Homo sapiens in the first place unless Homo sapiens was already a real form. In other words, unless that form or idea in its uh, organization and morphology and behavior existed in the mind of God in eternity, then it would never have come into existence anyway. I just think that's really interesting because um, that's sort of how we think from a Christian perspective. Of course, these biological blueprints had to have been worked out in the mind of God from all eternity. But I think it's interesting because uh, he's thinking in terms of teleology, right? He's thinking in terms of uh, this has all been preordained and worked out by God that Homo sapiens then become the teleological end uh, for for humanity. Now, I don't believe that. I think every single organism, not just a species, has a teleological end. In other words, the, the genetic changes that exist in each and every organism express themselves in such a way that that 
organism reaches its teleological end or purpose. And that would include even things like abnormalities, uh, things like dicephalism. And that's where you have uh, like uh, whales that have been born with two heads or pigs that have been born with two heads. Now, now those organisms, they don't live very long. But I believe that even those organisms are reaching their teleological end. Why? Well, because this world is broken. The world is cursed and the world is suffering. I mean, it, it, it reaches its teleological end because God promised that if Adam and Eve rebelled, then uh, they, there would be judgment upon them. And from Genesis chapter 3, we can see that, that judgment applies uh, to the earth as well when it was cursed. So one, we see the consequences of their actions in the world. And number two, uh, that kind of suffering, it's meant to evoke within us um, a sense of um, displeasure. It's meant to evoke within us really a sense of horror at what we're seeing. We're meant to see the suffering in the world and it's meant to draw us to Christ and have an eternal perspective. Um, it has a purpose. No, it's not good, but it has a purpose. Uh, we're not meant to, as National Geographic thinks, uh, to look at these things and just say, well, that's the circle of life. No, the, the entire creation is screaming out and saying, I am broken, I am suffering, and this is meant to push us, as Paul says in Romans 8, it is it has been brought to vanity, it has been subjected to futility in hope, in hope of an eternal perspective. And I think that would be a good segue to talk about this paper that was published by Randy Galuza from uh, ICR, that's the Institute of Creation Research. And um, he talks about organisms sort of being able to feel their way and adapt automatically to environmental changes as though they were pre-programmed to uh, adapt to those environments as they uh, experience pressures from them, which is really fascinating. So this is actually scientific evidence. Um, and these are some quotes from the paper. He says, we hypothesize that organisms actively and continuously track environments, environmental variables and respond by self-adjusting to changing environments. Uh, then the next one, adaptation happened largely through regulated gene expression and not gene inheritance. These observations consist of CET, contrast starkly with the evolutionary framework's randomness of tiny accidental hit and miss phenotypes fractioned out to lucky survivors of deadly challenges. So what he's saying is, uh, and this is fascinating, is that each organism, it would seem, is able to anticipate the environmental pressures and adapt accordingly. Now, that is a non-materialistic principle because in, uh, in the concept of materialism, in the worldview of materialism, things don't sort of, they're not built with the information allowing them to change when they enter an environment that they had not anticipated. That cannot happen in materialism. But in a Christian worldview, where God, who is sovereign over the environment, and I've heard it said that, um, you know, uh, there are no rogue molecules in the Christian worldview. And I think it was R.C. Sproul that said that. And I believe that, which means every grain of sand out there is exactly where God has ordained it to be. And so when that organism encounters the pressure from that grain of sand, then the pre-planned genetic abilities, the latent abilities that exist in that organism, then respond to that uh, selective pressures that are coming from that grain of sand. And then it fulfills its teleological purpose at that moment. I think that's amazing when you think about how... Uh, life really exists in terms of teleology and final causes and not this sort of bottom-up evolutionary perspective where sort of everything that evolves from something else is just sort of a random accident. Okay, the last thing that we want to talk about here is uh, we talked about the physical and biological laws. 
uh, influencing and constraining our six-pointed uh, star in conceptual morphospace for organisms that are going to diversify and change in the real world. But there's another element as well of constraint, and that is uh, we've already talked about human usefulness, right, for pre-fall uh, humans, but there's also human hindrance. In other words, uh, just like with dicephalic organisms, uh, they serve a purpose, uh, a preordained purpose in the plan of God, so does giving animals the ability to cause hindrance to humans. That also serves God's purposes. And so those constraints are going to be built into uh, the organisms that eventually will diversify in the real world. So, for example, in um, Genesis 3.18, God says, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Notice that the ground has been cursed with thorns and thistles for a purpose in order to hinder Adam and to hinder ultimately humans. Uh, in Leviticus 26.22, speaking of animals, And I will let loose the wild beasts against you, which shall bereave you of your children and destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, so that your roads shall be deserted. So here, animals are being used in terms of divine justice against the people of Israel for their sin. So they're being used to hinder humans. Uh, here's a passage from Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. I won't read all of it, but it talks about, you know, uh, the wolf dwelling with the lamb, and the lion eating straw like an ox, and lying down with the lamb, etc. But the last part there, from the underline onwards, uh, it says, They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. So here Isaiah is talking about beasts, wild beasts, that in the past have been used by God to hurt and destroy. Again, um, these animals are serving a purpose, and that is to hinder humans, because that is the result of God's judgment on the human race, uh, at the fall. And with this, John Frame um, agrees. He says, God intended nature to live in harmony with human beings, but when Adam tore nature apart by eating fruit God had forbidden, the result was disharmony between man and animal, man and woman, humanity and God. God cursed the ground because of Adam and Eve so that the ground would not easily give its fruit. Uh, in other words, God's predetermined plan was to hinder man's efforts. And so that brings us then to this um, slide. And of course, we uh, brought this up in parts two and three. Please go back for a greater discussion uh, in those parts. But essentially, uh, the whole purpose of what we're doing in, in the last part and this one is to try and explain this, um, uh, this phenomena of continuity. So what we are looking at here uh, are uh, from a creationist perspective, four different created kinds. So on the right uh, is Sinusoroptrix. So here's Sinusoroptrix. Uh, Sinusoroptrix is a cursorial. That means it's it's a, a land-dwelling theropod dinosaur, completely land-dwelling. Uh, this is the skeleton of Archaeopteryx, which actually flew. Uh, this is the skeleton of Confuciusornis, uh, an avialin. And this is the skeleton of a bird, specifically a chicken, and so it represents the bird group. Um, these three here, this one, this one, and this one, are all extinct. Only the bird is actually extant, uh, which means living today. The problem is, why do we have continuity? Certainly between these two critters right here. Why is there continuity when one of these was created on day six? So Sinusoroptrix was created on day six. Archaeopteryx was created on day five. And yet, when you look at them, you can see that structurally, they're very similar. Why is there continuity between two different creatures that were created on two different creative days? Um, I've already talked about uh, the concept of common design. Common design does not answer this question. If you think it does, then leave a comment. I exactly what does that mean? What does common design mean? And again, before you answer that uh, and write a comment, go back and listen to what I've said in the previous part. But it doesn't answer the question. Uh, we can also look at this 
uh, from a functional perspective. Um, functionalism doesn't work either because uh, these organisms, for example, these uh, uh, like Archaeopteryx and uh, certainly this Confucius Ornus here and the chicken, um, at least originally, um, they all flew and they would have had diets and lived in ecosystems like in trees and in forests eating insects and things like that that were very different from Sinosauropteryx which was land dwelling. It may have eaten insects but the way in which it caught those insects, the ecosystem that lived in, the way it hunted were very very different from these other three over here. So we can't appeal to functional things to answer why the morphology is the same. We can only appeal, it seems, to a structural similarity. In other words, there is a structural similarity between all of these organisms, and of course that led, is what led Darwin to come up with his uh, theory of, of evolution. Uh, and, and his idea is, well, this is just a basic ancestor, this is more evolved, this is more evolved again, this is more evolved again, but they sort of all come out of this basic structure which evolved uh, somewhere in the past at the beginning. And of course, as creationists, we reject that hypothesis. So um, you can see uh, that I think that structural idea, though, I think it works. I think it's a good hypothesis that there is structure, there is continuity of structure between these organisms. And when I ap apply this slide here um, and put a kangaroo in the picture, you can see it's very, very different. Um, you can see that the kangaroo, even though it's got you know two arms and two legs and a tail and a skull, it's very, very different than all the other organisms. And you can see great levels of discontinuity. And remember, the kangaroo was actually created on day six along with Sinusoropteryx on the right-hand side. So there definitely is continuity here, a structural continuity that exists between uh, these four organisms, of course, not including the bird, I'm talking about Archaeopteryx, which has now sort of left the building. Uh, okay, so keep that in mind now. What we're trying to do is we're trying to explain why that is. So here's uh, a diagram. What we're looking at here is the red lines, of course, we've already looked at. That is the sort of um, uh, the, the cursed original created kinds. And the little uh, green dotted lines, they represent species that have sort of naturally diversified from those originally cursed created kinds. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And we can actually apply taxonomic ranks to these things. So for example, over here, these uh, green uh, dashes would represent a species each. So there would be four species, and all of those four species actually come from this original cursed created kind, which also would be a species. So we would have a total of five species there. And we can increase that taxonomic level. So, uh, no, that's not a bunny rabbit, um, but that is actually, uh, now we have three different genera. So these two species make up a genera, these two make up a genera, and this one itself makes up a, a genera. And then we can continue adding taxonomic levels. So all of these together would equate to the level of a family. And then if we can incorporate, let's incorporate just one more of these original cursed created kinds, and we have an order. And we can continue going on with this taxonomical ranking. So here we have a class. And of course, all this is hypothetical, just to give you an idea of how all of this would actually play out. So uh, we can see then uh, this pattern, and actually th this pattern is well known uh, in uh, biology, and uh, it's called a nested hierarchy. And I think nested hierarchies are real. You do tend to see uh, this concept of nesting in biological form, and it hasn't uh, missed uh, the uh, thinking of creationists. So this is actually um, a presentation done by uh, Dr. Kurt Wise, his devotional biology series. I recommend watching, that's really good. And he talks about this concept of nested hierarchies. So you can see here we have uh, uh, the little uh, dots are actually species, and then the circle around the dots would be a genus, and then you have two genera, and then you have a family, then you have an order, and then you have a class, much like I just showed you. Now the difference is though, in uh, Wise's um, uh, video, he doesn't show us how all of these different 
rankings are connected to each other. We recognize that those rankings are there. And of course, Darwinian evolution wants to account for that ranking in terms of Darwinian evolution. Um, but Wise doesn't actually talk about, from a creationist perspective, how all of these things are connected, even though in this picture, you can see that there is a sense in which, for example, uh, this uh, group here, this order here, is closer to this order than it is to this order over here. So that even in uh, this video, he is showing some kind of relationship between these different classes, but they're still not connecting with each other. And I propose that we can connect those things based on everything that we've looked at so far, uh, certainly this idea of, of sort of conceptual morphospace. So if I superimpose the uh, part of that grid, remember this is the lower half of the grid that we've looked at previously, over these different uh, taxa represented on this slide, you can see that the original conceptual morphospace grid connects all of these organisms together. In other words, there is a continuity that exists between all of these organisms. It just exists conceptually in the mind of God. There is a continuity that exists there. And uh, what we can then do is we can actually now superimpose uh, some hypothetical groupings over this, uh, over this grid. So we've got Manorotoriformes over here, which represents a group of theropod dinosaurs. Uh, we've got Manoraptora, which is another group of theropod dinosaurs, Aviale, uh, which we could consider to be a, probably a bird in the modern sense. And then, of course, this grouping here, which would be birds. Now, apart from birds, this group here, these other groups are all extinct. Oh, and, and these groups, by the way, Manoraptora formies, basically you can think of, I think this is a, a grouping of theropod dinosaurs that have feathers, but they don't have the semilunate carpal bone, uh, which is essential for flight. Manoraptora, however, represents a group of theropods that do have that semilunate carpal bone in there. And that enables the, the, the bird to sort of fold back its wrist and so tuck it under. And that is some, something that is essential for flight. Uh, Aviale would be uh, fully flighted uh, critters. And uh, so they would be very, very close in their morphology to that of what we would call modern day birds. So that's sort of how the groups are broken down. But notice when you look at birds, for example, uh, birds are sort of more closely related, notice the quotation marks here, everybody, to this group, Aviale, than they are to Manratoriformes. There is a connection, a continuity that exists between them, but there is also a sense in which some groups are more related to other groups. And that helps us then if we superimpose our different uh, four animals that we looked at previously on our grid. So here is uh, birds. So the chicken, that represents birds. And so of course, all of these over here would represent birds. And then you have our group over here, uh, which is Aviale, represented by Confucius Saunus, which is right over here. And this one here is Archaeopteryx. And this one here is Sinusoropteryx. Now, Sinusoropteryx is off the grid. It would be further up the grid off the page here because from a conceptual morphospace perspective, it has greater degrees of discontinuity than these other forms do down here. And so this answers the question then as to why there is sort of a continuity that exists between these forms. And it also answers the question, for example, of why Archaeopteryx would be more similar to Sinosauropteryx. And that's because um, they are closer in conceptual morphospace than, say, Archaeopteryx is to a bird, which may be a little further away in conceptual morphospace. So hopefully that sort of makes sense uh, of this hypothesis. And again, uh, you know, this is a hypothesis. There are a lot of, unfortunately, uh, a lot of creationists out there that don't like us thinking sort of outside the box. So I expect some negative uh, responses. Um, I don't really appreciate those, um, but if you could be critical in the way that you respond, that would be much appreciated. Um, now, keep in mind as well, uh, for the critics out there uh, who say, well, this is just basically a Darwinian evolution. Look, it looks like a clade. I mean, uh, Darwin has already sort of come up with the idea of continuity, already solved that problem. Um, 
But the reality is, remember, if you go back and watch part three, uh, in the beginning of this video, you'll remember that the concept of continuity was actually something invented by creationists. It was actually creationists who really began to think about and write several books on biological continuity before Darwin even published his book. So this concept of continuity is actually a creationist one first, not a Darwinian one. So if you're a critic, don't start saying, well, this is just Darwinian evolution. You're just sort of looking at something and, and, and now trying to, trying to cover your tracks. No, these ideas were actually published first. So um, that's it then from me, uh, Ken Colson here at Creation Unfolding. Look, uh, if you enjoyed this video, then please go ahead and hit that like button, subscribe, ring the bell for easier access to more videos as they keep getting uploaded. Uh, there is a donate button now as well. Uh, you'll see the link for that in the description. Uh, please, if you feel in any way whatsoever led to donate anything, I'd really appreciate it. I do spend a ton of time doing research, uh, as you can appreciate, into all of these different subjects. Uh, there's a website, www.creationunfolding.com. Go there. I've got other kinds of resources as well. Uh, there's a book, Creation Unfolding, if you're interested. And look, above all, of course, the most important thing is prayer. So if you could pray for me right now, just a few seconds, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.